open your Bibles anywhere to do. <laughs> All right, it is good to see you this evening. We want to welcome you here in the uh, classroom and then those uh, in Stanford, Nebraska by way of uh, video and uh, pray that you've had a a good Thanksgiving holiday and eat everything you wanted to and uh, looking forward to uh, Christmas. It's not the holiday season, it's the Christmas season. Amen. It wasn't for Christ, we wouldn't have Christmas. Of course, that'll make a bunch of liberals mad, but that's all right. It don't bother me. Amen. Take your Bibles tonight, open to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 4, verse 12. I'm going to use that verse as a springboard tonight and uh, give you some things tonight that we've studied and uh, hope it will be a help to you and encouragement. Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 12 says this, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, God's Word is true. It's always been true. It'll always be true. Amen. And uh, I'm glad that we have something that can help us in our lives. Amen. When God comes in and the Holy Spirit takes up residence, then uh, the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, begins to dissect us, body, soul, and spirit, and teach and train us each and every day. And we've been studying the Christian and psychology and how that psychology in the last 30 years has creeped into the church. Right. And uh, they've tried to uh, do away with the Word of God uh, in helping people. Uh, if you're going to get counsel, you better get godly counsel. Amen. And uh, you better get it from a man of God. You better get it from the Word of God. That's right. Uh, you can go through the, the Bible, and you'll find that that's always true uh, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. When we need help, we can go to Him. And uh, we can find that help. But uh, you got a new handout tonight, and uh, it begins with uh, question number 51, I think, and we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, you'll need those last three pages that uh, I gave you tonight for the uh, rest of the uh, course here. We've got one more class coming up next week. But tonight, we're going to look at codependency. Codependency. And then we're going to look at uh, codependency. Uh, and the biblical view. So, uh, got to learn how to spell biblical there. Okay? Got a Y on it for some reason. Uh, we uh, understand that uh, men want to help men, and I, I, we've named some names, and we're not throwing uh, rocks at those men. We're not criticizing. But uh, the Word of God's true. Again, we've got to stay with the Word of God. And any time we take anything and put it above the Word of God, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. Amen. So we need to, to hold on to that. In the way of introduction, codependency is one of the hot topics at the moment in modern day psychology. Uh, until recent years, the Word uh, and even the concept was virtually unknown. Uh, my daddy never read books like Spock and all these others they say you're supposed to read to rear your children. Uh, he used a, a peach limb and a hickory switch and uh, I thought it turned out halfway decent. Amen. He taught me to respect my elders, to say yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes. yes sir, no sir, please and thank you and all those good things and uh, uh, he did a good job uh, for what he knew. And uh, he believed in God, he trusted the Word of God and uh, I'm going to see him in heaven one day. Amen. So I'm glad for that. But uh, this is virtually unknown to us. Now everyone seems to be codependent. Got to have a, a, a group therapy to talk to. You got to have a, a therapist that you go see. Uh, can I tell you the greatest therapist you'll ever meet is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey man, I met him 35 years ago this past October, and uh, hey, he's been with me all this time, and he's, uh, he's good all the time, so I, I don't have to worry about that. I just look to him and depend upon him. The goals of this session are to define codependency, 
uh, to look at what psychologists tell us causes it and to examine its uh, supposed effects on people and find out how to cure it. Uh, finally, we'll examine all of this in the sight uh, and in the light of the Scripture. So, uh, first of all tonight, uh, the definition of codependency. We'll get to that just in a minute here, and that'll be question uh, 51. Uh, defining the word uh, codependency. Uh, originally, Codependency was used to describe a person whose life was affected as a result of being involved with someone who was chemi chemically dependent. And that comes from the 12 Steps uh, to Destruction, page 15. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, making, uh, you know, seeing something glamorous, but... Uh, I tasted some alcohol in my day, and I never went through a 12-step program in order to get out of it. Amen. When God saved me, God delivered me from that, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. And uh, 35 years, I've drank all I want to. Amen? Yeah, right. That much right there. And I want to tell you, I got a hold of something, and or something got a hold of me Amen. that uh, changed my life. And uh, uh, if you ever get high on the Holy Spirit of God, you, you've had a high that you've never had before, and you'll never have again. And, uh, I mean, He'll walk with you. He'll help you. Uh, he'll strengthen you. And you need to depend upon Him. Today, however, definitions vary so greatly that it's often difficult to be certain uh, what is being talked about. Uh, for example, a codependent person is one uh, who has let another person's behavior affect him or her and who is obsessed with controlling that person's behavior. And that comes from uh, uh, Miss Melanie Beatty, uh, codependent no more. And uh, then we find the definition here of codependency. Codependency can be defined as uh, the addiction to people, behavior, or things. There it is on the screen for you. That's one of your questions. Now, also, let me say right here, codependency is the fallacy of trying to control inferior feelings by controlling people, by controlling things and uh, events on the outside. Uh, God works from the inside out. Amen? Uh, that's uh, what happened when we got saved. God began to change the heart. God began to change the mind. And uh, we get our flesh under control, and we uh, walk with the, in the Spirit, and uh, we won't fulfill that lust of the flesh. Uh, we'll, we'll have some problems, we'll go through some things, but if we know the, the mighty counselor, uh, and uh, by the way, he is, if you'll read the book of Isaiah, he is the mighty counselor, and uh, you'll find help there in him. Now, to the codependent control, uh, or the lack of it, is central to every aspect of life. When it comes to people, uh, the codependent has become so elaborately uh, enmeshed in uh, the other person that the sense of self-personality and identity uh, is severely restricted. It's uh, crowded out by other person's identity and problems. And uh, that comes from the book, Love uh, is a Choice, by uh, Helmuth, Minnereth, and Meyer. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. But uh, they say codependency is the condition when your love tanks are running on empty. <laughs> well, I want to tell you one thing. I never knew how to love until I met Jesus. Amen. I never knew how to love my wife. I never knew how to love my children. I never knew how to love a brother or sister in Christ. I never knew how to love a sinner. I, I never knew how to love anybody until the Lord Jesus Christ came into my heart, came into my life. Things begin to change, and God helped me. Also, they say codependency is a pattern of painful dependency on compulsive behaviors and on approval from others in an attempt to find safety, self-worth, and identity. And... Uh, this definition is used at the first national conference on codependency in 1989. 
like I said, this has uh, only come about in the last 30 years that uh, uh, psychology has entered into the church. Now, we're going to look at the dumbfounding of the term. Confused? <laughs> well, you can be. Uh, even Melody Beatty, the uh, acknowledged spokeswoman for codependency, admits this. She says there are almost as many definitions of codependency as there are experiences that represent it. Now, that ought to be question 52. So it's going to be hard to define codependency because uh, too many people have it and too many people don't know what it is. So uh, it's going to be hard to define. Now, uh, in desperation or perhaps enlightenment, some therapists have proclaimed codependencies anything and everyone uh, is a codependent. So uh, that makes us all codependents. So that statement, uh, I am codependent on one person. Amen. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, he washed me into blood. He saved my soul. He made me clean. So I'm dependent upon Him. And uh, that's what's going to take me home one day. Uh, that same resurrection power that uh, brought Jesus out of that grave is going to be the same power that's going to take me out of here. Amen. And uh, I, I believe it's very close. Not only are experts uncertain about what this disorder is, they are also not sure who has it. <laughs> they know a whole lot about nothing, is what they're saying. And that's question 53. Here we uh, see Minerf and Meyer tell us that uh, roughly 100 million Americans suffer from codependency. Uh, I don't know what the population is of America is. Uh, it's probably uh, uh, way up there. Uh, but think about 200 million, or 100 million, if there's 200 million people in, in America. Think about that. 300 million in America. How many? 300 million. 300 million. So that's one-third uh, of the world, or of the United States, that needs uh, a, a codependent. Uh, that, that's kind of sad, I think. And therefore, he says, we are embattled by an epidemic of staggering degree. And this comes from their book, Love is a Choice, page 14. Uh, it has been estimated by yet another source that 85% of the codependency market, and ladies, this is for you, they're female. Boy, they like to get down on the females, don't they? Can I say that I believe the female has a high and exalted place in the life of a man? Amen. If you notice, God didn't take the woman out of the head, or He didn't take her out of the feet. He didn't take her out of the back or out of the front, but He took her uh, out of Adam's side yeah. to walk beside the Him Amen. to be a helpmate. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for my wife. Amen. I'm glad she's a prayer warrior. Amen. I'm glad she's got a level head. You say, well, how can you tell she's level-headed? Well, when I married her, she dipped snuff and it run evenly <laughs> down both corners of her mouth. So I know she was level-headed. Amen. Don't you tell her I said that. I'd be in trouble. The reason for this is that mainly the traditional feminine traits and behaviors such as nurturing, mothering, and developing intimate relationships are often considered symptoms of codependency. I, I don't see that. And I don't know how they see that, but they do. He goes on to say, women who have chosen to be caretakers and nurturers rather than put their own feelings and desires above others are labeled codependent, in need of psychological help. Let me tell you who you're helping when you're helping those uh, psychologists when you're going to see them. You're helping them to buy new homes and bass boats and campers and Porsches and all those other things. Uh, it's, it's a money rack. And uh, if you can't get help from God, you're not going to get help. Because I believe God's the answer to all our problems, all our needs. God is the answer to America tonight. And uh, we've turned from Him. That's why we're in the shape we're in. Now, while we would acknowledge that uh, these traits can be carried too far by some, we're, we're greatly concerned when we are told that virtually the whole adult population, especially women, he says, is suffering 
from this disease. Now, uh, growing up, I thought a disease was something like mumps or measles or chicken pox or something like that, and I had all of them. But they're calling this a disease, and uh, it's not a disease. Uh, the problem is it's a sin problem. It uh, goes all the way back to Adam. Uh, could it be that the psychologists are confusing codependence with unselfish acts of love? I, I believe so. Uh, just, just do what you want to do is what they tell you. And, and uh, you know, like yourself, love yourself, no matter whether it hurts anybody else or not. <clears throat> Growing up, my mama was a good example before me and before my family. My daddy came first. Amen. Amen. Ladies, y'all listen now. My daddy came first. He had first place in the house. He sat at the head of the table. He got the first choice of meat. He got the first serving of every meal that we had. And uh, the children waited. And uh, then we were served. So uh, she set a good example. Uh, he'd come in from work. She'd have his bath water ready. He, he was a coal miner. She'd have his bath water ready. She knew what time he'd be home. She had clean clothes laid out for him. And uh, she, uh, she took care of him. She washed and ironed our clothes. She kept us clean and uh, made us bath once a month, whether we needed it or not. <laughs> and uh, has anybody ever taken a bath in a number two wash tub? Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. <laughs> Been there. And uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, she was a good example. And uh, I wasn't codependent on her. She wasn't codependent on us. But she, uh, she did what a woman was supposed to do. Now, note, it is the goal of anti-codependent proponents to turn us into a race of people who serve and love self more than others. If so, they are in contradiction with the Word of God. Look in Philippians, if you got your Bibles, chapter number 2, verses 3 and 4. Philippians chapter number 2, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says here, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Uh, we ought to be looking around to see if we can find needs. Uh, another hero of mine I buried just uh, a few years ago. Uh, he was the kind of man that looked for things to help people. Uh, the scriptures over in Ecclesiastes uh, says this, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And uh, that's the kind of man he was. And uh, a lot of times he'd take money out of his own pocket, he'd be on handicap ramps, uh, he'd uh, pay driveways, whatever he needed to do. Uh, he'd uh, make sure people had firewood. He'd cut uh, the widow's grass. And I mean, he'd done this up until he was 86 years old. I will tell you, uh, he, he never thought about self. He thought about others. He put others first. And that's what we ought to be doing. That's what the Bible teaches and tells us to do. There's your scripture for you. So you can see it good. Now, we're going to look at the cause of codependency here. The cause of codependency. Uh, what causes a person to become codependent and what are the effects of the illness? Here again, they want to call it an illness or a disease uh, on the life of the codependent. Well, Minerth and Meyer had claimed that uh, the causes of codependency are unmet emotional needs, that's 54, Lost childhood, that's 55, and dysfunctional family. It says, while these causes are uh, interrelated, we will nevertheless take them one at a time. We're going to look at them here. Let's talk about the unmet uh, uh, emotional needs. The theory here is that uh, we each have a reservoir of love or love tank inside us. Uh, I don't... I don't see that. But that's what they think. If our love tanks have not been filled by the significant others in our lives, we will not have our emotional needs met. We will therefore become codependent. 
man. Uh, I, again, I just I don't see that happening. Uh, again, I didn't know how to love until I got saved. Didn't know how to love until I got saved. Then, this theory, especially true, it says, of children. That's what they say. Children become codependent. Uh, I got a little grandson that's 18 months old, and I want to tell you, he's not codependent. He's independent. <laughs> he, uh, he took his hand, and uh, I had to go teach last night, and he took his hand, and he knocked some plastic containers off of the table that he'd set up there and stood there and stomped up and down a time or two and my wife smacked him on the bottom and told him to pick him up so he just sat down in the floor and throwed him a temper tantrum. <laughs> and uh, 20 minutes later when I had to leave, he still hadn't picked him up. <laughs> so he's kind of independent. And uh, so uh, I don't believe that theory there. Okay, lost childhood. Children lose their childhood through abuse, usually by parents and parental figures. Let me tell you how children lose their childhood. Parents try to live out their life in their children. They push them to be the best in school. They dress them up in clothes and send young girls off to beauty pageants. Hello, I'm preaching good now. Say amen or I'll be here for three hours. <laughs> They, they make them grow up too quick. And uh, that's wrong. Child's got to be a child. Child's got to be a child. Can I tell you something else? Let me, let me help you pastors. Uh, children got to have a place they got to be children. That's why there's a nursery, ladies. And uh, if you see a child that's misbehaving... Or you see a child that's showing off, you know, just go up and politely say to that lady, ma'am, we, we have a nursery. Could, uh, could I take your child back to the nursery for a little while? Hello. Amen. Help that preacher out. Because I want to tell you, a crying baby will distract the crowd, but a smiling baby uh -huh. will distract the crowd. Uh -huh. And I've seen it happen. So... Uh, uh, help, the, help the pastor out. I don't know how I got on that rabbit, but I had to chase him. Amen? I shot that thing. Mm -hmm. Now, active abuse such as incest, physical abuse, or even excessive anger on a uh, parent's part uh, is the most recognized form of abuse. Abuse that we must not deny or minimize. Now, I'm not going to deny it or I'm not going to minimize it because I know it happens. I work bus racks. I work bus routes in Chicago, and I'm going to tell you, that's a rough area. And I work bus routes here, and I work bus routes other places that I've been. And I know how children are treated. And they're slapped around, they're beat around. Some have uh, uh, had, uh, uh, you know, been sexually abused, all these things, and I'm not making light of that. But again, the problem is a sin problem. Man get his heart right with God, God's going to change that. Amen. God's going to do something, and God will intervene. It says, however, are, are we told of more subtle forms of abuse that apparently leave similar scars on a child's life? Again, Minerth and Meyer inform us of the following forms of abuse not recognized one parent who is preoccupied and unavailable to a child emotionally, a child who is not constantly praised, lack of touching and hugging in the family, parents not being at peace, uh, uh, with one another, sexually, uh, parents, uh, sexual abuse, parents uh, who deemed too much, uh, parents d depending too much on their children, and a parent who is too rigid. Now, uh, I'm going to mention a couple things here we need to address. Uh, what a terrible pressure the codependency view places upon parents. Think about that for a moment. And at what point do we cross over from being emotionally available uh, or overindulging our children? Uh, I want to tell you, as a pastor, as a preacher, I had to be very careful. I have two girls. And my girls, they need attention. 
but I took time to take my, my girls on a date once a week. So you took your girls on a date? Absolutely. I take them out and buy them dinner. I take them out and buy them lunch. I take them out and buy our new dress. And I do the same thing for my wife. And uh, uh, again, I didn't know how to love, but I didn't know how to do that until I got saved. Amen. It's things you learn. And, uh, you know, uh, the Bible says, bring your children up in a nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children unto wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, I realize that uh, the husband is the breadwinner most of the time. Of course, we live in a society now where uh, we've gotten to have so many things that uh, both parents have to work a lot of times. And uh, so, but uh, you've you got to be there for those children. You, you've got to help them. And we've got too many children in our country today that the parents are working and getting things and not spending any time with their children. And I can understand that uh, they have some problems emotionally. But, again, the cure is to get back to the family as God created in the Bible. Hey, there's only two institutions God ordained in the Bible. Number one was the family back in the Garden of Eden. And number two was the church in the book of Matthew. So uh, we've got to get back to, to do things right. When are we being too rigid rather than firm? Uh, I'm not bragging on my girls, but uh, I'm bragging on my girls. Uh, I had taught them, and I could snap my fingers. And that's all I had to do. And they knew to stop what they were doing. And uh, I, I didn't abuse them. Uh, when they deserved a spanking, they got a spanking. But I didn't spank them when I was mad. I waited, and I talked to them, and I told them why I was spanking them, and then uh, I, I took them somewhere and bought them ice cream. Amen? <laughs> you say, man, they did things to get rewards, didn't they? Sometimes. Sometimes. They know how to get Dad around the little finger. Now, how do we know if we're expecting too much from our children or not enough? Well, you've got to learn that, children's, uh, that child's personality. Uh, my children didn't, didn't grow at the same rate. And it's the same way in the church. Uh, baby Christians, and there's older Christians, and then there's some older Christians that are baby Christians that they've never grown. And so you, you've got to learn that personality. You've got to spiritually discern what's going on in their life. And, and so uh, it's, it's a great pressure that's put on us by the codependence in rearing our children. Then number two, I would mention this. Uh, what a horrible position to be in knowing that the, the answers to these questions are relative, yet nothing that uh, failure on our part will scar our children for life. Now, uh, I believe that you can give them some emotional scars. Even as a safe person, sometimes we won't make the right decisions. That's why we need that walk with God. That's why we need... Uh, uh, being preached to and being taught each and every week, each and every service, and uh, depending upon God to lead us and to guide us. Likewise, instead of blaming our parents, think about this, instead of blaming our parents for the mistakes they made while raising us, we must take responsibility for our own actions. Hey, we make choices every day. And the biblical view would, would be that parents do, do have a responsibility to their children, but that uh, they are not responsible for the choices their children make. We try to raise our children and teach them and give them the knowledge to make good decisions when they begin to get out on their own. But you know what? My girls still come to me for advice. And I'm glad for that because I took time for them before. And, and they'll, they'll ask. And I, I can offer uh, some experience. Uh, sometimes they don't. But when they do that, I say, as my mama used to tell me, well, it's your bed. You have to sleep in it. Amen. Amen. So uh, pretty wise. Mm -hmm for somebody who wasn't educated, didn't read spot. <laughs> so I'm glad that she taught me right. 
By, by the codependent definition of abuse, virtually all children in the past have been abused and should have developed uh, into codependence. How could parents of 10 or more children always have been emotionally available for them? Now, I don't know. Uh, there was only five children in uh, my family. Uh, Miss Kim's probably got the biggest family in here now. She, she might could answer that. But uh, my grandmother had uh, 16 children. And uh, they all turned out pretty good. I had four uncles that fought in World War II, and they had a praying mama. All of them got wounded, but all of them come home safe. Amen. So uh, uh, they turned out pretty good. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we listen too much to the media. We listen too much to the world and not enough to the man of God. There's a problem in that. Hey, and, and we're, we're at, the, at the point now where the, at the push of a button, we can get any kind of information we want. Amen? I got on the computer the other day and was checking for about an ingrown toenail and in three clicks, I was clinically dead. <laughs> Think about that. Hey, we need to use some common sense. Uh, my mama used to say, People's got a lot of book knowledge, but they don't have any common sense. And I see that today. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Uh, even more importantly, if codependency has been our problem all these years, why didn't God give us instructions on how to deal with it? It's nowhere in the Word. And I believe God's Word's complete. I believe God's Word's infallible. I believe it's inspired. <laughs> I believe it's, uh, uh, you know, preserved. It, it's there, and God never, never, you know, had that in there. Uh, are we to believe that God allowed all of His people until the 1980s to be equipped to deal uh, with uh, grave problems? Are we to believe as well that God has not chosen to deal with codependency in His Word? but has revealed this problem and its solution mostly to ungodly men or ungodly women. What are you talking about? I'm talking about Floyd and I'm talking about Maslow and I'm talking about Baby. Why would God do that? I've uh, I found a lot of answers by prayer and fasting. It'll cut You'll seek God. You'll depend upon Him. Now, we're going to look at the... That's old Mary from Meyer again. Am I going the right way? Mary from Meyer. Yeah, that's who I want. Mary from Meyer tells us, We all possess a primal need to create the familiar. The original family situation, even... If, it, if the familiar, the situation is destructive and painful. Now, I can refute that because I know men who have been saved, I can take you to one right now in our church. And he never misses a service. His dad was the town drunk. Died, lost, and went to hell. And this young man got saved and he's in the church. And you're talking about picking a bass fiddle I mean, he can. And uh, he uses his talent for the Lord. Sing. Sings in the choir. And uh, doesn't miss the service. And he'll call and he'll say, Preacher, any good revivals around? I want to go to them. And he's raising his uh, uh, family in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, uh, you know, there's countless others that can give the same testimony. Uh, so why would we want to, uh, you know, recreate a painful situation? Why would we want to go back into that? We want to get away from that, I think. God give us good sense to do that. You say, why? Because we're compelled, he says, by our unconscious minds that actually control, we are told. 80% of our decisions apparently without our conscious knowledge. I don't think I made any decisions today without knowing about it. <laughs> no about you. Sometimes I have to stop and wonder where I'm at. 
there about once every six months I'll wake up uh, sometime during the middle of the night and look around and there's no light shining in the room I wonder where I'm at yeah. but uh, I, I don't think I've made any unconscious decisions I think all, all of them's been conscious and uh, most of them's been pretty good I haven't stepped out in front of any cars or anything lately <laughs> you know haven't shot myself in the foot like my buddy did you know be careful with your guns amen uh, I mean foolish stuff that they bring forth. But, but why would we unconsciously choose to put ourselves through such pain? And he says consider the following three reasons given by followers of codependence. Uh, he says we believe that if the original situation can be drummed back into existence this time around we can fix it. We can cure the pain. We, 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 we know we can and you know what they're using to do that? They're putting people under hypnosis to call up memories from the past. And I want to tell you, I think some of them is fabricated. Amen. And, uh, you know, it can do a lot of damage. Uh, they've had uh, young ladies uh, call up memories that uh, their daddy molested them when they were little. And then the daddy got arrested for that and then we come down to the final end of it. Uh, they got mad because Daddy wouldn't let them go out on a date. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. It happens. The codependent process uh, possesses a powerful need to go back and to fix what was wrong. Uh, he must cure the original pain. Again, I can't see going back. Can I tell you what yesterday was? Yesterday is a cancel check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. Today is cash in hand. We have to live in the present. We can't live in the past. We can't live in the future. We take it one day at a time as God teaches us in His Word. I don't know what tomorrow holds. But I do know who holds tomorrow. And so we've got to look to Him. We've got to depend upon Him. Number two, he says, we believe that we uh, were responsible for the rotten uh, original family. Therefore, we must be punished. We deserve pain. Uh, codependence may actually be hooked on misery. Do you ever think about that? Sometimes misery loves company. Amen. We're going to get down here to this fellow here now. The third uh, thing they say is we believe that there is a, a, a yearning for the familiar and the secure even if the past was painful, at least it was home. I won't tell you, my daddy corrected me. He never beat me. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I've had some, we call them whoopings up in West Virginia. I don't know what y'all call them down here. But uh, I've had some boards. And it didn't hurt me. And I won't, I won't tell you what, I respected my dad. My dad was a respected man in the community. I went to a, a builder supply that I knew that my dad had dealt with for years. And uh, on a handshake, I got $50,000. That was back in 1983. That's the kind of character my dad was. It's the kind of name he had. And, uh, you know... Uh, my dad wasn't an educated man, but he was a, he was a man of character, and uh, he trusted God. John Bradshaw, popular TV author and TV codependent guru, lays the blame on biblical teaching that everyone is born in the condition of sin. That's 57 and 58. Think about that for a moment. Hey, God's Word, when it says that I was born in sin... I was born in sin. Jack, you have to squint to see that. Yeah. Biblical teaching, conditions of sin. Hey, David said, Behold, I was born in sin. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And this is for the psychologists ever come up with this mess. I'm just going to trust the Word of God. Amen. I'm just going to depend upon Him. And he contends that uh, such teaching produces a shame-based 
personality destined to become an addict. Well, I'm looking around at a pretty good group of people tonight that don't look like it's affected you much. You got saved the same way I did, by grace. Amen. You realized you was a sinner. You repented of your sins and trusted Christ as your Savior and uh, confessed Him with your mouth. You got saved. Amen. Amen. Uh, he says, Many religious denominations teach a concept uh, of man as wretched and stained with original sin. Well, that's what the Bible says. Amen. And I'm going to believe the Bible. Amen. Amen. With original sin, you're, you're beat before you start. And that comes from his book, Healing the Same uh, Shame That Binds You. Uh, actually, the, the various experts, you know what an expert is, don't you? X is a has-been and a spurt is water under pressure. <laughs> Comes up with uh, various and often contradictory reasons why they believe that people become codependent. Uh, why so many options? Well, perhaps this quote from the University of California uh, wellness letter explains the problem uh, very well. The, it says, and I quote, the literature of codependency is based on assertions, generalizations, and anecdotes. To start without the single shred of scientific evidence uh, and I uh, casually label large groups as diseased uh, may be helpful to a few, but it potentially is harmful and uh, uh, exploitative as well. I don't know why that when we seek answers, we go to an ungodly world. God has the answer. If, uh, as the bestsellers claim, all society is an addict and 96% of us are codependents, that leaves precious few of us outside to, to, uh, the rehab centers. But at the, that point, the claims become ludicrous at best. And Mr. Bobkin made that quote. Now, note, there is neither scientific nor biblical evidence to support the claims of those who teach the theories of codependency. But why should truth get in the way of that good thing? It's a money racket. I promise you. They may give some help. They may hit on some problems. But... Uh, only God can change the sinner. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to look at the effects of codependency. Uh, we're, we're being told that it is very difficult to discern whether the behavior of a codependent was caused by illness, by his illness, or the illness was caused by his behavior. And uh, at any rate, Melody uh, Beatty, uh, groups the problems of codependent people uh, around the following categories. Uh, we're putting categories, by the way. Uh, number one, caretaking. And that should be the answer to 59 through 72. Number two, low self worth. Number three, repression. Number four, obsession. I think somebody who's obsessed with somebody else may have a little demon possession myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Controlling. There are people who have personalities that they want to control. I'll admit that. But it's not anything that God can't fix. Amen. Denial. Hey, I was in denial a long time. 31 years. I didn't need Christ. I didn't need God. I didn't need the Word. But boy, when I got saved, I found out how crazy I was. <laughs> and I am codependent now on Him. Dependency. 
Number seven, poor communication. Number eight, weak boundaries. Number nine, lack of trust. Easy. Number ten. Easy. Easy. Am I going too fast? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're on the board. You can see them. Poor communication. I can't see to you. Somebody said the pen was mightier than the sword. I thought it would be fast as well. <laughs> Communication. Weak boundaries. Weak what? Boundaries. Weak. In other words, we don't set limits on things. Weak boundaries. Weak boundaries. Lack of trust. Anger. Can I tell you I had a problem with anger before I got saved? Now, I've done construction work all my life. I was working on a building... And I was trying to measure with this uh, broken rule, and I couldn't get it to measure, and it's the only one I had at the time. And I threw that thing way up in the woods, and uh, I happened to think, there's nothing open today, I can't get it in another ruler. I have to drive 45 miles to get another ruler. So I had to go up there in the briar patch and get that thing so I could finish my job. <laughs> I had a temper. Sex problems. Miscellaneous, whatever that is, and progressive. In other words, they go from one to the other. Now, after reading her list, you realize that few, if any, can totally escape the codependent label. Well, they throw out all kinds of labels so that they'll cover the whole uh, gamut there, and uh, they, they say, you, you got this. This is your problem. <coughs> and uh, if you give me $100 a session for 20 sessions, we can cure you. Hello. Brother you mates go get mail. I tell you. <laughs> Let's go back to Minner from Meyer for a moment here. Minner from Meyer blame addictions and compulsions on codependency. Even more importantly, they claim that a codependent is unable to obey God. I don't believe that. The Christian's foremost privilege, think about this, the Christian's foremost privilege, we go forward, the Christian's foremost privilege and responsibility is to hear and respond to God. That should be your last two answers. Now, let me make this statement in closing. If we think their way, how cruel God must be to demand obedience from people who cannot obey because of their emotional illness, caused usually by harsh parents. Most of the problems we say today are caused by parents. That's what the psychologists tell you. Uh, then punish them because of their disobedience. God's not like that. God hears. God hears. He heard every sinner's prayer that was ever prayed. And God provided mercy and forgiveness when we didn't deserve it. And He saved our unworthy souls. Now, see that bold statement down there at the bottom? Either apostles of codependency are right, or God, in His Word is, we cannot have it both ways. Amen. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to trust God. Amen. I'm just going to depend upon Him. And uh, you think there's psychological problems now? Wait until the rapture takes place. Guarantee you, there'll be people who go crazy. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You tonight for loving us. Thank You for our time together this evening. I pray that You'll Bless and touch uh, those you made in the hour to come.
God, uh, give us wisdom as we teach from week to week. Help us to uh, impart what you've given to us that we may rightly divide the word of truth, stand upon the word of God, and be a light and a witness to this lost world. Help us now, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Is it possible to get a copy of that stuff you need to do? Is it possible for us? I'd like to have a copy of that.